Welcome to AFMC Online. My name is Pastor Kevin. Just want to thank you for tuning in through our YouTube link and also let you know that we continue to plan most of our ministries outdoors. And so uh, we're continuing to have worship drive-ins every month. In fact, our next one is scheduled for Saturday, October 17th at 10 a.m. here in the church parking lot. And we are also just reevaluating our church reopen plan on a week to week basis. And we'll let you know as soon as we open the doors up, which we hope to do as soon as we think it's safe and wise to do so. Um, we also have annual leadership conference over Zoom yesterday where we had different elections and our church delegates were online. This is a gathering of all of our pastors and elders in the PCJC conference and um, there were updates about our entire conference and election and our superintendent which we hope to give you the results of this coming week through our church emails the last thing i want to let you know is we are still doing operation christmas child as a church the program will obviously look a lot different this year and so what we're asking people to do is even now as items and and toys are on sale as school has already started um, for those who want to participate this is not just a kids church ministry event. Uh, we hope any individual or adult or family would participate with us. And so you're welcome to buy items um, like school supplies and toys. The lists are on the Samaritan's Purse website. And what you can do is in the month of, actually anytime on Wednesday or Friday between 11, and 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., you can come by church and pick up uh, your free Operation Christmas shoe box and then fill it up at home at your leisure and then return it anytime in the month of October through the end of October. You can return it again on any Wednesday or Friday between 11 and 3 p.m. Those are office hours and we wanna to continue just to love on those who have very little. And so we're gonna also continue to give different service opportunities that we're gonna let you know about very soon. And with that, I hope you partner with us in this, but with that, we're gonna begin our service with some time with a time of musical worship. Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you here. It's so good to, uh, to worship with you this Sunday morning, uh, to draw close to our Heavenly Father, uh, no distance. Uh, we are unified under the, uh, the mantle of Christ and under God's love and grace, which is extended to all of us. Uh, so as we uh, get our worship service started, we're going to start off with a few songs of praise. Uh, so if you're able to stand, I'm going to invite you to stand right now and prepare your hearts for worship. We're going to start off by singing the song, Our God is Great. Let's sing this song together. Our God is healer, awesome in power. 
power of our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, and you can never stop us, and if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then you can never stop us. And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Our God is greater, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is healer, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer. We're our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then you can never stop us. And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then you can never stop us. And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? your strength. We pray for more of your strength this morning.
earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing we weren't to praise, then even the rocks would cry out, Father, that these, uh, the stones of the earth would, would uh, attribute to your, your majesty, God. So, Father, as the creator of the universe stands with us and draws close to us, uh, Father, we draw close to you this morning, and we pray that you would illuminate your scriptures, uh, that your presence would become more and more real to us every single day. So, God, we give you this time. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, at this time, uh, feel free to pause the video, grab a cup of coffee, and when you come back, we'll be hearing the word this morning from Pastor Kevin. So we'll see you in a little bit. So last Sunday, we began a series called Moving as One, which is on the topic of church unity. And our desire as a pastoral team is really to help our whole church navigate this time where there are so many external forces that are causing division within families, within marriages, between generations in families, between friends, uh, between people in church, between churches, between pastors. Um, there is so much even just in this political environment right now that is really causing a huge division and just a huge gap where there is no middle ground right now. There seems to be no middle ground where anybody can come to any agreement or compromise or understanding or listening or empathy. Um, this past week, if you have just pay attention to the response of what happened in the Breonna Taylor case, um, you've probably seen that there is a massive gap between this is the person and these are the people in the wrong and there is no if ands, but, and these are the other people in the wrong and you've either taken, it's very black and white where there is no room in between, no gray area for understanding. And so I, I just need to share, this is not a sermon about what was right or wrong in that particular incident, but my heart as a pastor is really pointing out that there is a real danger right now in what I would call cultural Christianity. And what cultural Christianity is, it's a phenomenon where people will allow their theology to be held captive by their politics, 
rather than having your theology, your understanding of scripture, your understanding of who God is and who Jesus is, rather than, have, than having that inform and transform your politics. And that is really what is a true danger, not only outside the church, but within the church especially. And I want to say that again, that culture of this cultural Christianity or culture war Christianity says that I'm, I would, I'm rather, would rather have my politics inform my theology rather than looking at what scripture says first, what God says first, and allowing that to inform and even transform my political identity and my political beliefs. And let me just say, this is not meant to be a political sermon at all. This is really meant to be, a, again, a unifying message where we are learning the way of Jesus is really about building bridges and not bringing up dividing walls of hostility, which we talked about last Sunday. And so if you read the scripture and you are never, you've never been offended or disrupted or convicted or stirred by the Holy Spirit, then it's possible that we may have conformed Jesus into our liking. And that is one of the dangers of cultural Christianity. What cultural Christianity does is it actually promotes the original sin of humanity. It goes back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And what they did is they conformed God into their likeness. And when we look through the world, through our political worldview, and we look through that lens first, and then we try to allow, look for Bible verses that support our pol political view. We look for sayings of Jesus or what other pastors say to support that. What we're doing is we're actually conforming God into human likeness, which is a real danger. And so what, what we need to do, even especially those in the church, is we have to always be, in a way, using our conscience to figure out what is popular opinion, what is majority opinion, may not always be in, in the best interest of the kingdom of God. Which takes us back to maybe just the bottom line point of this opening part in Matthew's teaching that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and not seek the kingdom of any political party. And this is a lesson that we have even seen throughout history. This goes back to even at the beginning of World War II in Nazi Germany, when Nazi Germany was beginning on its rise, there are some historians who actually note and say that at that time, Germany was considered 94% professing Christians. There were 94% people who were professing Christians. And in that context, how can you have so many people that profess the way of Jesus, uh, the, the scriptures, and yet they were seduced by the evil propaganda of Hitler and his Nazi regime, which led to so much destruction, so much death and evil. And it may be an oversimplification of obviously a very complex situation, but that may actually show the dangers of what happens when we tie our faith to what is commonplace, what is popular, what is majority opinion, or may, may even be what goes in that time and in that place. And so this is not the only example of cultural Christianity, even as recent as 1994. If you are familiar with the, the genocide in Rwanda, this was a true tragedy in the history of our world nearly 25 years ago, where for about 100 days, approximately 1 million Rwandans were murdered, were killed. And in that 1 million, there were actually 800, about 800,000 minority Tutsis who were killed at the hands of extremist Hutus. And the reasons are complex, and this involves decades of dehumanization, of painful history, of dangerous policies, and so on. But what is not complex was that this was a situation of Rwandans killing Rwandans, of neighbors killing neighbors, family killing family. There were even... Hus some husbands who killed their Hutu and Tutsi wives 
Um, Christians killed fellow Christians because the mind-blowing part of this tragedy is that during the time of the genocide, both of the ethnic groups were predominantly Christian. In fact, it's, it's recorded that over 90% of the Rwandan population claimed and still claims adherence to the Christian faith. And even in a situation like that, there could be so much death, there could be so much evil, so much opposition. And these tragedies should give us a stern and firm warning about the dangers of placing any allegiance above our obedience to Jesus and the kingdom of God. In other words, that there is a real danger of connecting our culture and Christianity together or the danger of cultural Christianity. And so this is a time um, now more than ever where we really need to understand what it means to seek first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of any political party. And within this discussion, and part of the reason for this is, this is not a, a message that means that we need to all conform to a similar belief system and we all should look the same and act the same and um, behave the same way. Um, church unity has never been a haven for uniformity. And so the goal of church unity is never ultimate uniformity or conformity because how boring would it be if we were all one gender, we were all one ethnicity. What if we what if everybody in church had the same gifting or the same calling, we're all the same age? I mean, how boring would that be if we were all mass produced uh, like Starbucks espresso drinks and we all kind of looked the same, had the same shape and so on and so forth? Um, that is not my understanding of the way of Jesus, that our strength as a church, as I alluded to last Sunday, actually comes in the diversity of our backgrounds the diversity of our opinions and the diversity of, of how we look and how we may act. And by the way, I was reminded that, that Jesus himself, in choosing 12 disciples, 12 followers, intentionally choosing, these were not people who came to faith later on and just joined the movement because you know, it was attractive or appealing, but Jesus intentionally chose 12 people and many of them were actually very different. They were, some of them, very different political affiliations, different, they came from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And there may not be a better example than the example of Simon the Zealot, who was part of a, who was part of the, the Zealot political party, which was more like an extremist or some may consider almost a terrorist organization that was against the authority of the Roman Empire and the Roman Guard. And that was in Jesus' group of 12. And then you have Matthew, who is a tax collector, who is literally on the payroll of the Roman Empire. You could probably not have two more diametrically opposed political opponents or enemies. And yet Jesus calls them into relationship. He calls them into one singular mission to one singular movement. And so following the way of Jesus, there is beauty, there is, um, there is reconciliation, there is redemption when we are able to even bridge the gap between people who are very, very different from us. And so taking that point further, I, I, I want to just note that when we are talking and moving about church unity, I think what oftentimes what is parallel with church unity is, is the idea that everything needs to be harmonious or we need to keep the peace, that there needs to be no conflict, that we don't have any disagreements or we don't have any arguments, that there's no controversy. But I want to communicate and express to us as a church, even at a time where we are not meeting in person and not able to gather and have in-person relationship as we would so much desire, is we have to understand that in a community, we're going to get it wrong. We're going to make mistakes. 
In fact, if we're living in an authentic community, we will offend or hurt. In fact, I'm sure I've offended or hurt or made mistakes um, where other people interpreted something, you know, I, I said, or I've said something wrong. And authentic community is a place where we can get through those conflicts and disagreements and build stronger trust and build stronger bonds because of it. And this is also reflected in the narrative of the early church. If you are familiar in the New Testament, there are pretty significant conflicts. There are conflicts at the Council of Jerusalem. There's a conflict between Paul and Barnabas where they disagree with who should come with them on, the, on their current missionary adventures. And then there's a pretty big conflict between Paul and Peter, which tell us that it is okay to have conflict. It's okay. Disagreements happen. But I hope and we will, as we'll see, that these conflicts happen on matters that are very essential. In fact, the, the conflict that I want to look at closer is actually on the topic of church unity. And so I want to go into Galatians 2, where Paul is recounting this, this conflict, this confrontation he has with Peter for his actions. And so if you would turn with me to Galatians 2, I'm going to read the passage for us today. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now, I just need to point out right off the bat on the surface level, um, Paul does handle his conflict resolution in two, two ways that I would not recommend. First of all, um, it's hilarious to me that, that Paul writes that when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. This is Paul's, obviously, his, his account. And then when you look later in the passage onto verses, uh, let's see, what is that, 14, um, Paul rebukes him in, in public. Paul rebukes Peter in, in, in public. And, and that may not mean that he did not already confront him in private. Um, but just two recommendations um, when you're dealing with conflict. I don't know if I would start with, um, I oppose him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Um, but nonetheless, what is helpful to understand is where Paul is coming from, where his calling, as it says earlier in the chapter, that Paul's calling was to do ministry and, and essentially missions to the Gentiles, while Peter's ministry is to the Jews. And what is, has been happening in this particular time in, in church history is there is so much uh, controversy and division about how these Gentiles who are coming to faith and um, God is doing miraculous things and bringing them as part of the, the, the family of God, the church of God. And yet the Jews, the insiders are really very hesitant. They're saying, in order for the Gentiles to be part of our community of faith, they need to become basically Jewish. Not only by religion, religion, but almost culturally, they need to follow all of the many laws and Sabbath and so on and so forth. And Paul, his whole time of, of arguing here with Peter and his conflict, even at the, conf, uh, at the Council of Jerusalem, he is trying to make the way easier for Gentiles to come to faith. And so even in this context, what Paul is really trying to say is, look, I have brought all, there's been all these people that have come to faith, all of these Gentiles, and now you are saying they all need to get circumcised, they all need to become more this and more that. And then you have, on top of that, you have Peter, 
who now, who used to hang out with the Gentiles, he used to, you know, fellowship with people who were non-Jewish, you now have Peter stepping back and putting up that delineation, that divide, saying, no, um, you Gentiles should stay over there, and I'm not going to hang out with you, I'm not going to have table fellowship with you. And what Paul is observing is that the other followers of Peter, including Barnabas, are following Peter's way. They're following his lead. And what Paul does is he's actually calling for a more unified church because he's trying to bring this group of Gentiles into the fold. And what he sees in Peter's behavior and what he sees even in the Council of Jerusalem is that the Jewish group is trying to say, no, you need to become Jewish first. You need to follow our culture, follow our ways, follow our religion, and then you can be officially part. But Paul's saying, no, they were already in because of the grace of God. That is what has justified them through faith. And so Paul calls out Peter because of his hypocrisy, is what he calls it. And what we find is that Peter does not necessarily really, they do not record too much of Peter's response. But what I want to point out is that Paul brings up this conflict in a very confrontational way. But he brings up something that is very essential, very important. And obviously this is very early in the church, but this was something that was of such a strong value to him that he could not back down on. But because of his heart for the church unity, because of his heart for the Gentiles, he was able to bring this up with Peter and they were ultimately able to work it out. Now it's unclear whether this actually happened before the Council of Jerusalem or after, but what we know is because of Paul's willingness to have a conflict, to have a confrontation, that the early church became stronger and grew even more immensely than it ever would could have because of Paul's trying to work out these conflicts. And I'm not saying he got it all right, his approach was right, and so on and so forth. But the idea and the heart of what I think Paul was trying to do is understanding that the heart of the gospel message was really about trying to build bridges between the Jews and the Gentiles, and he was also trying to bridge really the larger population of humanity and Jesus. He was trying to get rid of, rid of all the hurdles, all of the walls that would keep the Gentiles from knowing who Jesus was and being part of this community of faith. And what Paul gives us, even in this fiery, fiery conflict, is a reminder of our maybe our mission Maybe what is so appropriate right now here in 2020 that in the middle, in the midst of an increasing gap between political affiliations, an increasing gap in polarization on many levels, um, that maybe we as the church are the people to serve in the middle. And this is a, a, a moment, a historic moment where I, I think our church, we need to be the bridge builders um, like Paul, we need to be the people who are trying to bring people together rather than pouring fuel in the fire and causing even more division, more polarization, um, creating relationships that may never be, that bridges will actually be burned. And um, I don't believe that this is the way of Jesus or would follow what even the Apostle Paul is trying to do in his early mission. And so I pray that as we move forward, this would be a, a moment where we, we, people would not, we would not cause people to move to the left or move to the right, but that we would be a people that served in the middle and that people would not seek their answers, their whole um, worship or their whole idolatry and follow the, the elephant or the donkey, but that they would come in the middle and find that there is a lamb who is trying to bring humanity together under one God, one baptism under Jesus. And I know this is so much more easier said than done, but it's on us as the church to do the difficult work of trying to listen, try to be reconcilers, to uh, be bridge builders, to really try to be the glue that is holding a fracturing nation, a fracturing state, a fracturing world around us. 
um, because I, I thoroughly believe that this is the way of Jesus in this time. Uh, let's go to time of, of offering and worship. Uh, we're going to continue our worship service with the giving of tithes and offering. Uh, so if you're a member of our church and would like to continue supporting financially and prayerfully, uh, I'm going to direct you to our church website, which is found at anaheimfmc.org. And you can follow the links there to the giving page. Uh, but why don't we just go ahead and just take a moment to just process the, the words, the invitations, uh, the message that the Lord had for you today. Uh, let's just uh, give this time to the Lord. And in a few moments, I'll invite you to close with one last song. But God, we give you this time. May you illuminate in us your directions, your path, your invitations for us this morning. So uh, I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able, and we're going to close by singing the song, Your Grace is Enough. Let's give this time to the Lord. Church, will you sing these words with me? Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Your grace is enough. 
church, with that, will you receive the benediction for today? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace for today, for tomorrow, and forevermore. I pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, uh, we, we thank you so much for joining us today to, to meet with the Lord. We pray that you would uh, continue to meet with him throughout this week that he would inspire you uh, to, to be more like him, like, son, uh, like his son Christ, uh, that you would live uh, this upcoming week inspired and in, in walking in his love and in his grace. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week, everyone.